With me now on behalf of the government is its whip, Steve McKinnon. Hi, Mr. McKinnon. Good to have you here in studio. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much for coming on in. Uh, we just spoke with Erwin Collar, former Justice Minister and Human Rights Advocate, about what unfolded in the House of Commons today. And he is certainly among some Jewish advocacy groups advocating for the unsealing of the portion of the Duchesne Commission that does to this day remain sealed. Is that something your government is considering? Well, I know that uh, people, this, this event has caused uh, all kinds of reflections. You know, wars leave scars. World War II left particularly deep scars, and those are even more particularly deep in the Jewish community, among others. Um, and uh, perhaps one of the good things that comes out of this is we do have a duty to remember, we do have a duty to reflect, to learn more about our history. Um, and uh, perhaps one of the advantages uh, coming out of this is that we will all collectively, and I know the government will be reflecting uh, on these issues and continue to fight anti-Semitism, continue to fight for uh, the principles and the values that Canadians espouse. And, uh, and I know Mr. Kotler, uh, in his, both in his formal role and in his day-to-day -day life, will be uh, a valuable addition to that reflection. And, and certainly, uh, collectively, I think we are all thinking about what happened, and, and I mentioned that in my interview with Mr. Kotler. But my question is more directed specifically at the government. Given what has happened and what it has illuminated about Canada's kind of troubled history with letting Nazis immigrate. Is your government prepared to take further specific action, and by that I mean unseal those records? I think the government has shown uh, that it's uh, not uh, afraid, whether it's truth and reconciliation, and indeed uh, yesterday was the national day for truth and reconciliation, uh, that Canada can confront the painful uh, parts of its past. I know that this will trigger a number of conversations and reflections on the things that we might do. The Duchesne Commission was an incredibly valuable addition to uh, Canada's collective knowledge around uh, the post-war period. And, um, and I know that the government will be taking uh, those kinds of conversations seriously. I also wanted to ask you about a conversation that hasn't happened yet, and that is between the Prime Minister and President Zelensky. I mm. asked the Governor General in an interview that's about to air in a few minutes, as head of state, if she ha is considering or had reached out to President Zelensky. Mm. She said she hadn't yet, but it's something that she is considering doing. Why has the Prime Minister not specifically reached out to the President, given the humiliation this brought on him? The diplomatic channels, as you can imagine, between Ottawa and Kiev are uh, wide open and well-worn. Uh, and I have no doubt that President Zelensky has no doubt uh, about Canada's uh, embarrassment and, uh, and apologies for what occurred while he was here. We're well aware of uh, the advantage that the Russians will try and take uh, using misinformation, disinformation of, of this incident. Um, and uh, I'm uh, absolutely sure that President Zelensky is well, well aware of the views of the government of Canada about what transpired. I do understand the dipl diplomatic channels being open, but it's not just Russia that's using this uh, to uh, sort of propagate what it considers its view around denazification of Ukraine. I listened to a Republican debate, for a Republican presidential nominee debate the other day, in which one of the candidates used what happened in Parliament to support a position against sending more aid to Ukraine. Why does this not, in your government's view, rise to the level where the Prime Minister should call the President himself? Well, it rose to the level of the resignation of a Speaker of the House of Commons, which is reasonably unprecedented in our uh, over 150-year history uh, in the Parliament of Canada. It rose to uh, the importance of having the Prime Minister speak repeatedly and indeed in the House of Commons to express the apologies and embarrassment uh, indeed of all Canadians uh, with respect to this event. So um, I know that that uh, clarion call and that, uh, that message has gone out uh, through every possible channel. With respect though, Mr. McKinnon, I mean when you refer to the Speaker's resignation, that took almost two days to happen. The Prime Minister's apology took three days. There's no call specifically to uh, President Zelensky. You're not able to tell me with any specificity exactly what measures your government will pursue to rectify uh, the fact or reconcile the fact that we have uh, so many Nazis who, who had lived among us or had emigrated to Canada. Uh, is that enough? Look, I think we've had a national debate on this issue for uh, well nigh a, a week now. 
the Prime Minister has expressed himself repeatedly. Uh, I, I will do so again, just to reiterate the embarrassment that this has caused Canada, its House of Commons, and all elected uh, people in it. Uh, a lot of partisan games do get played, but I do think that Canada has taken all the diplomatic and corrective measures. And again, unprecedented events have occurred this week, that's, which is why we're here. Uh, the Speaker of the House of Commons has resigned, taken full responsibility for what has occurred. The Prime Minister immediately following the Speaker's resignation rose in the House of Commons to uh, express the views of the Government of Canada and the Parliament later. of Canada. With respect, it was a day later. The well, Prime Minister was at a uh, fireside chat in Toronto when the Speaker resigned. Well, the, as you can imagine, the Prime Minister has a number of events. He chaired the Cabinet meeting on Tuesday. He was indeed uh, doing uh, uh, important work for uh, Canada's economy in Toronto uh, on Tuesday. At his first opportunity, uh, he came to the House of Commons, not only delivered an apology, but spent uh, an hour in question period answering specific questions about this. As far as the way in which this all unfolded, when, when I interviewed you earlier this week or earlier last week, you said that you, you kind of characterize it as self-correcting in that, look, the speaker has resigned. If the speaker doesn't do this again, uh, they, they realize the magnitude, of, mag, magnitude rather, of what happened. They just won't do it again. I take your point on this is so mm. great that who would let it happen again, but that does still not actually put any formal mechanism in place to make sure something like this never does. Well, we have to make the distinction, and I don't want to dance on the head of a pin here, but we have additional and we continue to add uh, security measures with respect to who can visit the House of Commons, making sure that parliamentarians, staff uh, are safe and, and that our chamber of democracy is well protected. That was absolutely the case for Mr. Zelensky's visit and every other occasion that I can remember. Uh, we do not uh, impose a kind of intellectual uh, purity test on, on those visitors and you would not want the government or any government to uh, to, to do uh, that kind of work. I know that uh, increased diligence will uh, be applied to that. This happened once in 150 years. How do you years. know that? And how will Canadians know that? I'm not advocating for a changing of the way Parliament works. And it's kind of interesting to me that every time a question is asked of your government in that vein, you rebuff it with, with that approach, right? You can keep the construct the same, but does the Speaker's office, for example, in your view, need an added layer, not of intellectual purity testing, but simply make sure no Nazis are here anymore? Probably. So, uh, and I have no doubt that the next speaker, whoever he or she may be, will uh, be examining those, uh, those very things. I have no doubt that uh, increased rigor, uh, more rigor than, than has been applied to this particular situation, will be applied uh, in the future. And that is probably doubly true for when we receive world leaders and have uh, speeches inside the House of Commons. Before I let you go, Mr. McKinnon, there's another sort of headline that's already generating some international reaction as well. And this one is about the budget cuts that I know your government is in the process of, of kind of looking at across the board, but more mm -hmm. specifically how they will end up applying to the Department of Natural Defense. That comes just a few months after your government agreed to a NATO pledge to spend 2% of GDP on defense. Was that just for show? Well, the President of the Treasury Board, I know, will have a lot more to say about the uh, exercise. I think Canadians expect. Uh, that the government uh, examine its expenditures uh, on a periodic and timely basis and that's the process that is occurring. If you begin those processes by exempting uh, any number of uh, departments uh, from that, then you don't get a thorough view. Uh, I know that process will unfold with a great deal of rigor and uh, I have no doubt that uh, the Department of Defense and indeed the entire government will want to ensure that things like our support for Ukraine, our support for the various missions in which we're engaged that do support Ukraine, for the important procurements that are underway, shipbuilding, uh, and fighter jets and others will not be affected, but we'll have to wait and see how uh, the Defense Department uh, makes its proposals and goes through this process. I mean, they, I mean, a billion dollars is a billion dollars, right? And, and you know, support for Ukraine, support for all the things you outlined. What about support for our troops, some of whom who've had to purchase yep. their own helmets? I think, again, there are Canadians who are watching that unfold and thinking, but wait, I thought just a few months ago we told NATO that we were going to step up, and, and rather right now it looks like we're doing the exact opposite. Well, I wouldn't prejudge the outcome of this process, but I can't imagine that uh, the process would be one that would start with uh, um, uh, uh, 
you know, uh, uh, impact on our troops or the various important things that I've just detailed to you. These so things. So what's left to cut outside of that? Well, the Department of Defense is a major expenditure area in the government, and I think that uh, everyone will have to go through this uh, uh, process. I know the President of the Treasury Board will apply a lot of rigor to that process, but a lot of compassion and common sense. Um, and uh, I look forward to the outcome of that. Does your government bear responsibility for putting itself in this position, given, for example, things like $54 million on the Arrive Can app, a 40% increase in consult money spent on consultants from 2015 to 2021, a 40% increase in the size of the public service over the same span of time. Did you kind of put yourself in this position where you have to go against the pledge you've made to your allies? The government made a number of choices specifically during the pandemic to be uh, of direct support uh, to Canadians, to businesses, to community-based organizations and others and obviously there's a pullback uh, uh, that, that occurs because the impacts of the pandemic have lessened and, and, and in some cases hopefully disappeared. Uh, so it's normal that we're going through a process now of examining expenditures uh, across the board. But it wasn't all you, pandemic you, spending. You Respectfully, the parliamentary budget officer said uh, about 30% of what you spent during the pandemic wasn't temporary in nature. Well, no, we've, in, we've initiated things like dental care. We've initiated the uh, child care, which have in, provided important benefits to Canadian families. Uh, we, we initiated the Canada uh, Child Benefit uh, and a number of other things that are making sure that Canadians have a chance to succeed. So as then we why go through. tell your allies you think you can meet the 2% commitment? We have, again, uh, outlined a number of uh, priority areas in defense. Shipbuilding, I'm intimately aware of. Uh, um, uh, things like aerospace expenditures and others. I know those things are proceeding. We have a duty to renew our armed forces. We have a duty to support our troops. We have a duty to support our allies, and uh, specifically Ukraine, as we go through this, uh, this period we're of a war in Europe. And I know an awful lot of care will be applied to this process to make sure that uh, those impacts if any, uh, will, be, uh, will be minimized. Mr. McKinnon, I'm going to leave it there. I'm out of time. Thank you for your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you.